Okay, hello everyone. Um, I am Venezuelan, but I'm not going to talk. I'm not going to talk about Chavez. Um, I'm going to talk about a different revolution. Okay, so how this? Okay, and that revolution starts from a microcontroller and it can end up into an entire city. Okay, uh, since I am Venezuelan, I I was taught during all my childhood about the colonization of America all the time. You know? And, and all the, in, in the school, they were explaining how the, how the two worlds encountered together. So that was um, in the 15th century. And even though I'm jumping a, a little bit of, a, of, of some thousand years of the human history, we can believe that imagine it is similar to if today we find life in another planet. It's basically as that big, that shift that we live in the, um, during the 15th century. But at the same time, it happened something that fascinated me more. Um, in the same 15th century, the press was invented by Gutenberg. And believe it or not, it was a very special fact. And those facts they went together, and they could not be separated, because otherwise, all the knowledge and information could not, could not be transported into the speed to, from one side to another. And because that knowledge and that information was transported in this speed, we can achieve this. You can achieve the Renaissance. One of, one of maybe the biggest, uh, let's say, landmarks, in the, if you want to call, to call it like this, in the human history, in which we started to achieve, the, let's say, mastery in processes and science as never before. But at the same time, the Renaissance was the beginning of the first industrial revolution, or the revolution of the steam machine, which allowed to start to replace the work of a man by a machine, and furthermore, starting to develop a new system both in social and in economical ways. Um, that same revolution, let's say, can be called or evolved into a second revolution called by some experts that at the beginning of the 20th century was transformed into the chain production processes and sometimes called uh, Fordism because the, maybe the first product that was manufactured in this way was a 4T model um, um, at the beginning of the 20th century. So, there's something that happened, and during those same, that, during the starting of that uh, 20th century, as you many know, we had the First and Second World War. And that technology that was used in industry and, and producing cars was also used to produce weapons and all the milita mili military resources. And, and furthermore, the industry, the military industry, was really pursuing the development of new technologies that never are, as never before. But with the end of the world, all that technology was brought to the civil world, let's say. And something very important happened with the agreement of Bretton Woods, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank started to reshape the economical system worldwide. And also very importantly, some years later, the Advanced Research Project Agency and the NASA were funded to investigate into new ways of both exploring space or developing new techniques uh, for the Americans to be protected against Russians. Okay. So out of this, let's say, landscape in the, in, the mid, in the mid of the 20th century, things were invented like the computers. And the computers, uh, by that time, <laughs> maybe needed a space as half of this room to operate very simple and stupid operations that you cannot imagine. And maybe your cell phone that you have in your pocket will do, I don't know how many millions of times, more operations than those computers. But also were developing uh, computer control machines, machines that connected to those computers could operate, um, let's say, operations, uh, could, could perform operations that were instructed from those computers. And furthermore, um, some years later, these computers came out of, of that room, they shrink it, and they became personal. They went into our homes, into our desktops, and so a lot of people you know, give all the credits to Steve Jobs, and it's nice to give it because he's a cool guy. But there was a lot of people behind him, and in fighting for the openness of this, of this revolution. One of those guys was Vint Cerf, that actually is the father of the internet. And the girl next to Steve Jobs is called Elena. It's actually the first digital image broadcasted into, into the uh, DARPANET, that was the foundry, the foundry of, uh, of the internet as we know it today. Uh, Lina was a, a Swedish playmate, <laughs> and nobody knew that, on, and not even her knew that after some uh, uh, years later. So, 
We live in this world that we, we have shaped for the last uh, 50 years, in which, or even so more, in which personal computers uh, or the personal computation, the internet or the connectivity, and the centralized production are shaped us in a way, you know? shapes our society, shapes our economy, and also our cities. Um, that model we call it uh, in Barcelona, and also with our friend Neil Gersenfeld and Vicente Guayard, the PITO model, which means product in, trash out. It means that whatever we use uh, in the city or consume in the city is imported. And the only thing that we produce out of those products is trash. So in this model, things are being brought, let's say the raw materials are brought from some part of the world, then shipped with a lot of uh, car, um, CO2 emission uh, consequences to the other side of the world, and the final products are shipped to the consumption poles, and then we produce a lot of waste that maybe ends up in some, some other place. But most importantly, we're bringing, we're separating production from consumption. And furthermore, we're separate, separating the knowledge of making stuff. We just know how to use it. We just know how to consume a service or a product, but we, we don't know how to make it. Um, for that, we, there needed like, big factories in Asia to satisfy all our needs, um, to fulfill all the supermarkets, warehouses, and to find different options of the different tastes of anyone, because you like red, you like green, or you like salty, or you like sweet. So all these kind of things, the market needs to satisfy, satisfy it for us. But at the end of the day, we took all, all these things, and as I told you, this is what we produce as citizens, as people into our cities today. So what happens is in, in this formula, we change that last part, and we remove the centralized production by distributed production. And this is something that a lot of people, including the President Obama, is trying to reduce it into 3D printing. But it's not only about that. It's not only about having one single machine that it will be the magic machine which you press the button and it will print something for you. If you, if you allow me, I will, I will take a quote from Neil Gershenfeld, that is the father of the Fab Labs, and says that the boom about 3D printing today could be compared with the boom about microwave ovens into the 50s. Everybody thought that they were going to replace the kitchen, but it didn't happen. You need another set of tools, a lot of more tools that you can find today in Fab Labs, which is the acronym of Fabrication Laboratory. The Fab Labs are spaces like this, it's maybe like as big as this space, maybe compared to where the computers were 60 or 70 years ago, in which you can find different processes, machines, and furthermore, more important, people, which with you share and make things together. Okay? So what we are trying to develop here is taking this idea of the ability of anyone making anything anywhere to change this PITO model into the DIDO model. In the DIDO model, it, it stays for, stands for data in, data out. It means that whatever comes in and out of the city is just bits of information, of knowledge, and whatever you need to transfer that information into atoms is located within the city, and also tied with a very strong recycling uh, plan. So, but this is not only about with this, the, the city itself. It's this city con the, the city is connected in a worldwide network of laboratories. Today we have 150 laboratories in more than 35 countries that share online resources, but also in each laboratory you have the same equipment. It means that someone from South Africa can send the files of a chair to someone in, the, in Amsterdam and make it right away in seconds. Okay? But more importantly, the, the thing that it are doing these Fab Labs is really changing, I think, that three aspects. No? And, and we can concentrate it in three main aspects. That's education, in the way how kids learn, how even in the master's level people learn, and economy, how it's going to be reshaped the way that we create business and how we create new products, and also the sustainability, how we can reduce the impact of the things that we produce and consume into the world. So this is why I said that we can make a Fab Lab, in, in a Fab Lab we can make things that come from a microcontroller made out by an eight-year-old child to an entire house made by an international team of researchers um, 
together in less, in less than three months. But actually, some, we're going beyond now in Barcelona. Historically, Barcelona has known that the, is the city where urban, the word urbanism was invented. And it's that's, that's why that we are developing the Barcelona Fab City project, together with the City Council of Barcelona. So if you look back in the history of Barcelona, there was a Roman city, the medieval city, the industrial city, the modern city of today, and the question is, what it will be the city of tomorrow? It will keep being the city of the, where people go and go party and just leave a lot of more trash and nothing um, about just consuming a spectacle in, in a weekend. So we're thinking in a different way. What if we, can, we consider uh, the city as a laboratory and as a way to prove that we can recover the productivity into the boundaries of the city? And not by reindustrializing. We have to separate this. It's not reindustrializing the cities again. It's bringing back the tools and processes for people to produce whatever they need within the city in a neighborhood scale, in a community scale. So this is, this is the map of, of, of the Fab Labs that by the end of the year, this is the amount of Fab Labs that we will have in the Barcelona city. This is the Fab Lab Barcelona, in which I work. Uh, this is the Green Fab Lab. A uh, fab lab located in the middle of a forest, also funded by, by the institute where I work. And these two new labs are very important because these are the ones that we are co-founding with the City Council of Barcelona. It's the public administration not only opening more libraries. Okay, we should still have the books. We put computers into the libraries later on. And maybe now is the time to put manufacturing facilities into the libraries as well. Okay? And this is the picture of Barcelona, maybe in the next six years, hopefully, in which we envision that we will have one fab lab per district, but not all of, not all of them doing the same thing. But all these fab labs having acquired a specialization in different fields that could be related with healthcare, that could be related with furniture making, that could be related with, related with energy production, or that could be related with mobility, all of them acting as an inner network connected to the rest of the world, giving access for people the tools to innovate within the city. Well, this is something that comes from a top to bottom policy, let's say. But what, what would we do in the other way around? We, at the same time, are working in a project. It's a pity that looks like this. <laughs> this should be blue. But you can read a smart citizen. This should be a logo in blue that would say, Smart citizen, upgrade yourself uh, with others. So basically, this is a project that we developed uh, within the Fab Lab and with the idea of this, generating the tools for the people to participate in the production of the city in a bottom-to-top approach with this same philosophy I've been talking before. The smart citizen considers like each person in the city is a producer of information, is a producer of bits, but it can become also a producer of atoms. What we need only is to have those tools that we connect with each other, not only into the social networks do. It means that why we cannot use Facebook or Twitter or, or mobile phones in a different way that only, not only just uploading our pictures when you have your birthday party, I won't do that, but also using the, the bits that you upload into the internet for something meaningful for your community. So it's something to think about. And for that, we develop a simple sensor board based on Arduino, an open source tool, in which each person of the city of Barcelona will connect it into their balcony, and we'll start to capture data about the environmental conditions of the public space. So this is in contradiction with the whole smart cities idea that big companies and governments are trying to sell us. That technology will save our cities, and we should make smarter cities. But who will be those smarter cities filled of stupid citizens? Where is, the, where is the citizen in this whole formula? So this is why we formulated this, this project. But it's not only associated of, about capturing data, and it has been said before, it's how we convert this data in information, in useful information, not only for me, but for the others, for the ones that are near to my community. So the coming future is it's very simple. We have it there. It also had been said before. We have all the tools in our hands, and maybe it's the time to use it in the proper way. And 
I think we are entering a kind of a technological medieval age. Back in the medieval age, all the things were producing within the cities. And let's say you were in the same place that you were working, you were living. You have the small workshop in which people were doing the, wood, uh, the woodwork and so on. Or maybe we are entering, if we compare that where we are now in comparison with the 15th century, maybe we are in the doors of a second renaissance. Thank you very much.